Welcome to The Truth In His Art. I am your host, Rob Lee. And today I'm in conversation with a Korean American writer and former educator living in Baltimore. The pursuit of collective liberation, healing, and human connection guides her work. Please welcome Kelsey Ko. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Rob. I'm really happy to be here. Happy to have you here. We're here. We made it. We're making it happen. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, So... I want to start off with, because uh, I'll be remiss, and like when you have that last line, the pursuit of collective liberation and healing, that's, that's, that's what, what, what really caught my eye when I was reading over the bio. So tell me more about your work and like why those like ideals were important for you. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate you noticing that too, because I think that's something that Um, Through my experiences as a teacher, I've kind of been bringing to the forefront more, have been thinking about a lot about what are some of like the core values and tenets that I want to bring as I like navigate my life as a human and continue to like be on this career path. Um, And so I've worked as a teacher in Baltimore City Public Schools for the past three years. And this year was actually my last year in the classroom because I'll be attending graduate school to study psychology and counseling. And that career pivot actually makes a lot of sense for me. And I'll go into a little bit more in detail. But basically how I kind of fell into teaching was I have been living in Baltimore for the past seven years. I went to college here and while working as a teacher in Baltimore city, I kind of just got more of a firsthand glance at the ways in which systemic racism and inequities have shaped our city just by working with my students and just interacting with them every single day for seven hours a day. Um, I just kind of really got to know that the difficult experiences that they were facing in Baltimore City specifically and as Black and Brown students, um, especially during this pandemic, all of that they were bringing into the classroom. And as a teacher, you wear a lot of different hats. You're a teacher, you're also a social worker some days, sometimes you are, you know, a food provider, Um, you're, you know, a lot of different things. And I think for me, what the hat that I felt the most comfortable wearing was in the role of someone who is more of a mentor and a counselor. Um, And as I got to know my students more, I began to pivot and realize that where I wanted to kind of deepen my skills. And I feel like my greatest skill personally is interpersonal communication and just deepening my skills with these experiences that I've had in Baltimore. I decided that I really want to work to become a therapist, um, hopefully for adults and students. So yeah, I think when I say a uh, healing human connection, collective liberation. Um, I think that, you know, working to kind of unpack the things that we've gone through in life and the traumas that we've experienced and um, being very intentional with that is a way in which we can go fight towards and go towards um, this idea of collective collective liberation among people in BIPOC communities have yeah. really experienced a lot of racialized trauma. Yes. And, and, and thank you for, for pursuing that. Cause it's a, it's, it's challenging work. I would imagine seeing it being around it. And I think, especially with, with young folks, what have you. And I think, um, the going back and touching on the pandemic as we're I, I feel like we've been perpetually in the fourth quarter of the pandemic, but I, I, I don't know if that's the proper nomenclature. But um, yeah, I, I think a lot of issues across many sectors um, were exposed because we didn't have we didn't have distractions. You like so some of the things that we're just living with, we're bringing with us, um, and it's like things are brought to the the forefront. Things are, 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 are brought to a head, and sometimes you have to be able to do some of that work to sort through it from an individual level, and then you know, in interacting within the community, you have to sort through those things as well. So, I, and I and I mean that in what I was saying earlier of you know doing that work and being in that lane and choosing to do it because you could choose to do a litany of other things but this is something that resonates with you and that's important with you and i think having that 
experience one being an adult and having your own things that you've encountered and and two like having a background in education and working with young people and seeing them at different levels of vulnerability and so on it's 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 something and so i applaud you for that i want to touch on uh this this next question here um so I read, you know, your earlier work geared towards uh, helping the youth, helping helping the youth out. Um, so, so think back to your childhood. Uh, what did you hope to be when you, you know, became an adult? Was was this like in in the plan? Like I'm going to do this. I want to be an astronaut and in, in a, uh, a comic book artist at the same time as a kid. Didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love this question because I feel like when you were young, I this was like the best question to be asked. Like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And, you know, I think that once you are an adult and you're past 18, like people don't ask that question anymore, but it still makes me feel really like happy and joyful inside. Like brings me back to just like the way I felt as a kid. So um, when I was young, I actually wanted to become a teacher. So when I was in high school, I wrote uh, my common app essay. So when you apply to colleges, you know, I wrote about wanting to become a teacher a lot of it was because I worked at a summer camp and I worked with young young kids and I just really felt like a sense of like calling towards working with young people. But also I just had a lot of great influential teachers in my high school career and I really felt that they'd made a big impact in my life and I was I would have loved to pay that forward. So I was lucky enough that I got to do that for these past three years and um, I feel very grateful um, because I've always been a people person. And I've always been someone interested in understanding human nature. I've loved reading and just learning about psychology and, you know, moral gray areas or justice system. So I think that's kind of where I started to pivot more to psychology now. Um, but yeah, I wanted to be a lot of different types of people. I also wanted to be a writer when I was younger in like wow. elementary school. So I feel really grateful that I've also been doing that on the side as well. Um, just writing for different publications and still kind of honing that craft. Um, and I think when I was young, I was like, I have to stick to one thing. But as I get older, I'm like, no, I can dip my toes in a lot of different areas. So so with that, that's a, almost a natural segue to this next question. So classically trained violinist so let's let's talk about that a little bit and, and dabbling in other areas poetry guitar journalism uh theater singing um so tell me about that experience and like really what what like drew you to like some of those interests um interests um mainly like the uh, violin and um i have other bullet points but i'll let you start off there yeah um so i when i was young music was always a really big part of my household my mom played the piano and she always played classical music as well like Beethoven and Mozart and things like that and I think sometimes we would just like listen to music and she was like oh yeah one day you were just like watching someone play the violin and you were like I would really like to get into that <laughs> and so that's like kind of how I just started playing I was started when I was four and I took lessons till I went to college basically. So wow. for 15 years. Um, and yeah, growing up, I played in different youth orchestras, like for my school, but also at a more local youth orchestra called like the junior string philharmonic young people's philharmonic. There was like a district orchestra and like a regional orchestra type of thing too. So yeah, violin was a big part of my life. I <laughs> met a lot of my friends through that, but I think once you start pursuing one thing in music, you naturally just kind of want to do everything. So I think along the way, I was like, I would like to play guitar. And I um, just kind of picked up the guitar and taught myself how to play. And I also decided to do theater in middle school and continue that throughout high school and was on stage performing a lot as well in choirs and stuff. So multi multi talented I'm hearing I'm, I'm yeah. loving this <laughs> thank you so you're welcome so writing is is something that you're 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 spending time doing and that's a an area of interest and falls into the creative sphere um which sounds weird the creative sphere that sounds something metaverse ish I don't know um what of the creative practices that that you've dabbled in that you could see really being a an alternative career, like, you know, applying your background soon to be in like psychology. <laughs> and that. So wh where do you see like maybe being able to combine the creative side to what you're pursuing um, academically? Yeah, 
So um, definitely writing has been like the main thing that I've been pursuing along the years. Um, as I was saying in high school, just English class. And also I took a couple poetry electives and would write poems and enter contests. Um, that's always been really important to me. And in college, I was a part of the student newspaper at Johns Hopkins and was lucky enough to, uh, in my senior year, also be editor in chief with my best friend. And I think I, I was... I got to dabble into a lot of different aspects of writing and um, kind of landed with um, more of like a creative nonfiction or just like personal writing is what I'm most interested in, but also with more of like a social justice or um, equity like psychology lens as well. Um, so I guess that's the one I'm actively pursuing, but if I didn't do writing, I would definitely also do music. I, I feel like there's not enough hours in the day to do everything, but... <laughs> Yeah, I've always, you know, I would would work with other people in high school and like sometimes like I would sing in their band and stuff, but I was like, that could be cool to do in the future as well. Like be in a band, you know, never say never. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. you know, as as I was reading, because um, I was I was on your website, I may have been, you know, like pretty much part of my research process feels like I'm doing a little too much. I'm like, yes, I remember this interview from 2001. It's like, I don't remember remember that interview but people joke about it so yeah. Bethlehem tell me about that like and oh. <laughs> wow you're really going back in the archives I love it <laughs> so ha having that it, was there any experiences like growing up there and, and ultimately coming here but any experiences there that kind of helped shape it? Because I know music was a part of, you know, life growing up and having an, an interest to in, in writing as well and all of these other many things that you mentioned. Um, but was there something about like growing up in that environment that kind of crafted and, and shaped your creative sensibilities? Yeah, thank you so much for asking that. Um, so my parents are actually Korean immigrants and we moved around a lot before we landed in Bethlehem. And that's where I started living from third grade until I graduated high school, basically. So I would say that's like where all my formative experiences were. Um, I think growing up in Bethlehem, something that really did shape me was just the fact that I was often um, one of very few Asian people in a space. I was often in majority white spaces or spaces where there were very few people of color in general. And I think Growing up, I that was very jarring for me in ways that I didn't quite understand yet. I think I felt very different. I felt very much like, you know, I would have these friends or I would be around my peers and I'd be like, they don't know the side of me and the side of me that speaks Korean at home, that only eats Korean food at home, that goes to see my family in Korea during the summers and things like that. And... Yeah, that kind of feeling of alienation and also wanting to belong, but not knowing quite how to belong, I think drove a lot of my creativity because <clears throat> um, music and also writing were ways for me in which I could express myself in a way that felt very comfortable. I, it was like an emotional container for me. So yeah, I, I don't know. Even thinking about that now, I feel very grateful because that's been the constant in my life. And even as I've gone to college and come to understand my Asian American identity more and come to understand where I fall in this, you know, movement for Black lives and also for moving towards collective liberation for people in our very white supremacist society, like music and um, writing and creativity have remained the constants and have helped me process those feelings. Thank you. I, I like the way you described that emotional contain. I like that. <laughs> 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 um, so I got a, I got a couple more like real questions. So some of these are like multi pointed cause I don't know why I did bullet points. It's weird. Uh, so, you know, I, I read, um, in your bio that you strive to cultivate a safe environment for future generations to tap into their own creative potential and to be authors of their own lives and stories. And um, so, so through the lens of creativity here, like ultimately, let's say five years from now, where, where are you, where are you looking at in terms of having that involvement, having this experience and kind of knowing where we're at and what the climate has been. And it's like, yeah, this is the direction I want to take all of the things that I have now from a social or political, even creative lens. Yeah, um, to me, 
Yeah. That's an excellent question. Cause I think when I think about creativity, it's just the power to dream and imagine. And I think in our world that really feels like it's falling apart right now, fostering that in young people is so important because they're the ones that are going to dream and imagine our future, yeah. um, even when we're not here. Um, and education is a huge part of a person's first 18 years of life. And I'm forever grateful to these the experiences I had as a teacher because I got to be a part of these students' lives as they experienced all these developmental milestones and also in this really historic moment where students came back from a worldwide pandemic. And when I think about my time in education and how it's often historically been used as a tool for oppression, like segregating schools, not giving POC students access to education, things like that. Um, I also see it as a way to improve your outcomes in life drastically and also be a space for equity for our young people. And uh, the classroom can really be that space. And as I've explained and as I've worked with my students, the reason why I'm kind of deepening my skill set in psychology is because of what my students have brought to the classroom emotionally and what they've experienced in their communities from gun violence, from, you know, systemic discrimination, redlining, all these things, and really feeling called to facilitating more healing spaces for others. Um, and, you know, a lot of research has shown that trauma can really impact the way we learn, the way we are able to navigate our world. And also it's shown though, that community and relationships are one of the most powerful tools for us to resolve that trauma and work through it. So I think in five years, I would just like to be someone who has more skills and is able to facilitate that more for others. And I think something that I really wanted in the classroom is, you know, you have 30 kids in the classroom at one time, you want to give love and attention equally to every single one of them at all times, but it's just physically not possible. Right. And I think when I was like, I would like to become a therapist, I was like, I would like to work one-on-one -on -one with someone and just go deep and really help them unpack these things that are going on in the world and be able to navigate it. So yeah, I'm just looking forward to learning more in grad school and receiving licensure so I can help others in Baltimore and, you know, elsewhere maybe to also navigate our difficult, difficult world. Yeah, it's the world is big and scary, you know, and uh, I think a lot of times uh, people who are in these spots of commenting on what's happening aren't, aren't cons don't, don't consider that stuff. And if you're seeing a lot when you're young, you're in those formative stages, they definitely have an impact on you. And this is unrelated, but it, it kind of connects in, in terms of these things that we're not necessarily looking at directly, but that have an impact. I, I saw something in terms of like, it was research done on terms of uh, class. And it was talking about like folks who don't have like air conditioning. As we're recording this, we're in, it's, it's a, you know, coolish day in August, but as we're recording this. And uh, one of the things that was mentioned is that, you know, people who don't have air conditioning, they were sleeping considerably less. Like, let's say six hours versus the eight hours you should be getting, maybe nine really. And that was showing like a life expectancy like over time that that's an impact. So one could make that connection through to, from class to life expectancy. Mm -hmm. And we don't try to do those connections or put those out there widely, but we can not, not you and I, cause I mean, we, we get it, you know, we're woke, <laughs> but I, I think people don't make those connections enough. Mm -hmm. So when you're hearing about, different things in the news or you're hearing about, you know, friends, families that are affected by all of these different things that, that happen in any major city. And there's not enough like resources that are there. And at times um, with the school system here, um, they're not like, you know, heating and, and all of these different things that you need. It's like learning falls down lower and lower and just kind of surviving. And, you know, as you know, you were touching on earlier, just that was happening during a pandemic for, for, for folks. And it's just like, I wonder what that class of people coming out, what they're going to be pursuing, you know, mm -hmm. as far as I want to go to, you know, college and specialize in this or focus in this area because, you see it and the strings were exposed on how 
these systems are in place and that they're faulty. Mm -hmm. So I got, let's see. Well, I got one more major question and then I got rapid fire questions for you. Ooh, let's you're, not, do it. you're not avoiding a rapid fire question. Everybody gets them. Everybody gets them. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so I like to throw out lessons because, you know, you have the, you know, the education background, you have the writing background, you have all of the many creative skills that you've accrued over the years. So what would you say are some, I mean, if you can hit each one, that'd be great. Uh, what are three most of the three most valuable lessons you've learned and you know as an artist because you are uh as an arts advocate because you are and as an educator Mm -hmm. yeah i think the first one is that relationships are at the center of everything um it's really hard to make any sort of progress in our world without being someone who values that i think the second one And the biggest one that I've learned over these years is just pouring into yourself and taking care of yourself helps you make space and room to facilitate that for others. Um, People often say you can't pour from an empty cup. And I think that's very true. Um, I think another lesson might be that, and I said this earlier, is is it okay if I repeat myself? Please. (laughs) Yeah, I was I was gonna say another lesson is. Creativity is so essential because it is a tool that helps you dream and imagine a better future for yourself and for others. And I think what makes the English classroom so special and when I was teaching was that it really, you can incorporate that so easily seeing yourself reflected in stories and have seen them as windows and mirrors for your own life is really empowering for students and giving them the chance to write about themselves, allowing them to draw if they want to draw as it relates to the books. All these things are really important. I like that. Thank you. So now it's time to get to that rapid fire point. And I've added a couple because uh, you've said some things that really caught my ear and caught my eye. So I was like, oh, okay. And I'm observing everything. This is the point of it being a visual medium at this point for me, at least. So uh-huh. I can come up with new weird questions. All right. So I'm going to go with a softball because I feel like we've already covered them. Out of all of the things that we were mentioned earlier, do you have any hidden talents? Oh. <laughs> See? <laughs> Out of all of them, which one is my hidden talent or do I have one that's not mentioned? Not mentioned. Uh, I actually can't <laughs> think of anything. <laughs> I was like, I I am good at taking care of my plants and my cats. I was like, that's not a hidden talent though. I was like, anyone could come to my apartment and see that. But <laughs> I was like, <laughs> what kind of plants do you have? Um, I have a variety in my room. I have like a pothos over here. I have a monstera. There's a bunch in the living room, philodendrons, all of them. I can't take care of plants. I can barely take care of my cat. He looks at me shadily like, come on, Rob, what are you doing, man? (laughs) Well, I've heard that cats have staff and dogs have owners. So what can you do? (laughs) (laughs) That's that's great. That's great. Yeah. That's really funny. Yeah. Um, So... Now it's now it's going to get a little weird. This question. Uh, so, I the, the the snack I had before uh, logging in to Zoom <laughs> was these uh, it was these like chips that are like agave and jalapeno like uh, tortilla chips, Ooh. and I just put like some cheese on there. But I love this is where my weirdness comes out. I love QP. I love the, the Japanese mayonnaise. I put that on everything. I also love QP. <laughs> I think my crab yeah. cakes with it and, and that and for a Oh, wow. That sounds so good. Oh, my, my, my crab cakes would definitely have like a Japanese flavor to it. Yeah. Um, but I, I find me putting mayo on nachos is a little weird. What is your weirdest like food combination that you're like, look, I like it. I don't care. This is what I enjoy. <laughs> Yeah, the one that my friends all roast me for is putting ketchup on everything. I and like I mean like everything, like mac and cheese. I put it on pizza sometimes. I don't know. I just think it tastes good. And I I think I've told my friends, you know, as a Korean person, I really like strong flavors. I grew up eating really like strongly flavored things. So most things just taste really bland to me unless I put sauce on it. So 
Yeah. I, I appreciate that. I mean, I mean, it's, it's all about flavor here. I mean, if anything, yeah. I mean, I, uh, my, my, my partner always, always gives me crap. She's like, Oh, I going to get the hot sauce. I see. I was like, look, yes. it's, not, it's like, it's not even about that. It's like, she's like, Oh, huh, you got go to John. I was like, look, can I have two seconds <laughs> to enjoy this flavor? <laughs> Give me a moment of peace. Let me eat my hot sauce. <laughs> um, what was the last book you read? The last book I read, it was Circe. Is that how you say it? Oh my gosh. Circe by Madeline Miller. It's, it's a Greek, like Greek mythology adaptation book. It was pretty good. A lot of my friends were reading it. So nice. Yeah. Uh, so I got hidden talent out of the way. Okay. Uh, something, it could be something mundane. It could be something, but something that recently brought you joy. Oh, that's really cute. <laughs> Something that recently brought me joy is um, last night, my partner made this really nice dinner and we got to meet his new roommates and I, it was nice to be able to meet new people. Um, I think that's something that I really took for granted pre-pandemic and now that I'm able to do that more, it just made me really happy. That's good. It's good. Uh, so this is the this is the last one because I I can't help but but notice in the background. No, actually I have two. I have two. So I'm gonna ask this other one first. Uh, in school, what was your favorite subject? English and AP Psychology when I took it. Okay, I I liked. Uh, I think we had psychology, but I was using it from a marketing standpoint. I had a career in marketing mm-hmm. back in the day. Mm-hmm. So uh, you know, I feel like I should have took a few other classes on how to be likable. <laughs> Well, the thing is, people are always like, you can't really teach that. But I'm like, I feel like there's got to be some pointers out there, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you started going into these like, you know, uh, behavior books. And it's like, oh, just yeah. you know, be this and don't <laughs> don't send the representative because people don't like something that feels fake. Like, right. Hmm. All right. So this is the last one. As I look into the background, I'm seeing stuffed figures in the background over your shoulder. So it makes me think of cartoons and comics and things of that sort um which one of you do you prefer cartoons or comics and either uh what's the last one that you enjoyed definitely cartoons i watched a lot of cartoons growing up and i wouldn't you know i wouldn't be lying if i said that i still watch spongebob sometimes on yes you should yeah online it's it's really good and they have the episodes up and it just makes me feel nostalgic, you know? And it's really funny because there are a lot of jokes that you only get as an adult now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I was, uh, this just shows you because I'm, I'm elderly. I'm an, I'm an old person. That's the, the mustache. I look like I'm, never mind. Uh, so uh, I currently have up on another window the original Ghostbusters cartoons from the 80s. Oh, wow. Because it's currently on Netflix. I mean, I'm currently on uh, Amazon Prime. So I'm like, yeah, 87, let's get it. <laughs> <laughs> You're like blast from the past. Let's go. Yeah, I was like, I'm going to ignore some of this because uh, the the thing that's really cool about it, like they, I think they were trying to like bring anime here or something, and the mm-hmm. quality of the animation is really good, but then the dubbing isn't as good. So it's just like you know some jive talking dude. I'm like, look, bless. But also, pet peeve, oh. pet peeve when it's off, it sucks. Yes. Subtitles are the way to go with things like that. This is true. This is true. I'm just lazy. I'm just lazy. I'm doing a thousand yeah. podcasts. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> so, with that being said, um, I think that's, I think we got it. I think we got everything. Um, so, uh, one, I want to thank you for being on this podcast. And um, two, I want to invite and encourage you to tell the fine folks um, anything you feel like we've missed and um, to tell them where to check you out, your work. The floor is yours. Awesome. Um, thank you, everyone, so much for listening. Um, if you want to read more of my writing, uh, I have articles out in The Atlantic, Maryland Matters. I've also been featured in Baltimore Magazine. I also have a website, kelseyhco.com, that I don't update frequently enough, but I will in the future. So you should go check it out. And you can follow me on Instagram at kelseyhco. Thank you. <laughs> so there you have it, folks. I want to again thank Kelsey Co. for coming on to the podcast. And I'm Rob Lee saying that there is writers, educators, future psychologists in and around your neck of the woods. You just got to look for them. <laughs> <laughs>